Hello and welcome to this episode of a Clean Bill of Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Galen Nuttall, and as always, this is the spot where I interview people who are up to amazing things, supporting and enhancing the lives of physicians, especially Canadian physicians. Now, I have a quick question before we hop on over to the episode. Have you ever wanted to work with a financial planner, pay them for their advice or a plan, but not have to buy a product from them? I got good news for you. I do that. It's called fee-based planning, where you pay for a plan that answers your top questions, like should I pay off debt or invest? Am I making the most of my corporation? How should I invest inside of my corporation? What do I need to do to be on track for retirement? And much, much more. If you want to know more and are wondering if you're a good fit for fee-based planning, head on over to galenhelpsdocs.com. That's G-A-L-E-N helpsdocs.com. Read up more about it and book a free call where you and I will talk and see if you're a good fit for fee-based planning. And now on with the show. All right, Jimmy, welcome to my podcast. Thanks for having me on, man. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. I'm going to give your intro in a minute, but before we even start that, I would love to hear from you. What's like one of the biggest things you see people or physicians get out of taking on coaching? Yeah. So I think that uh, in a nutshell, the biggest thing people get is empowerment when they realize that they no longer have to let other people control how they feel, uh, whether that's administrators or insurance companies, EMRs or the variety or host of other things that plague physician life and that they can actually take back that power and control their their feelings themselves. So uh, when they take that journey and they realize that they've been handing those keys off to over, over to someone else and that they no longer have to do that, um, that's a, that's a big uh, game changer for most docs. Wow. Yeah. And I'm hearing the things you listed, like the things that can take that power away or that control away. Like even as you were mentioning them, like staff or like your uh, insurance companies or whatever, like I can only imagine that as people heard those words, they were like instantly had some sort of, some listeners would have had an instant reaction to like, you know, just like, oh yeah those people really <laughs> drive me nuts. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Just like this instant visceral reaction. Like it's a, it's a, it's a long list. It is a long list. Yeah. I was talking to a doctor the other day about how uh, electronic health records, like I was like talking about encouraging a friend of mine to look at a different one. And she's like, you just dropped a grenade on his life. Cause that's probably like a pain point that he's not ready to talk. about. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause there was this health consortium that, uh, that looked into the, you know, various causes that, that lead to, you know, physician wellness. And there's, the list was like over 70 things, which in a roundabout way points to the fact that there are 70 things that also can, can take away from physician wellness. Right. And so it's a complex multifactorial problem. Um, and it turns out that we spend a lot of time focusing on those things that we can't control and very little Mm -hmm. time on the things that we can. So, you know, figuring that out and, 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 dealing with those, those things and finding the tools to help you do that. I mean, man, it's changed my life and I know it changes the, you know, hundreds of doctors that we worked with. Very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for jumping right into that conversation. And now for the listeners, in case you don't know, in case you didn't see the cover of this episode, I am joined by Dr. Jimmy Turner, who is the physician philosopher. And so very quickly, uh, so Jimmy uh, is a practicing anesthesiologist and certified coach for burned out physicians. And you love empowering doctors by teaching them how to master their money and their mindset in order to create a life they love. Jimmy is also the author of the Physician Philosopher's Guide to Personal Finance, which teaches doctors the 20% of personal finance that doctors need to know to get 80% of the results and the host of the Physician Philosopher podcast and Money Meets Medicine podcast. So awesome. So for the context, I, I did a little bit backwards today. I just wanted to jump right into what, what you're up to in the, in the world and then like put down that intro. Um, yeah. So you said that you've helped hundreds, you've supported hundreds of physicians with coaching and like, I'm always fascinated. So I've interviewed a lot of coaches and I'm a big fan of coaching. I've been in coaching programs as a coachee mm-hmm. uh, and a coach every once in a while, but mostly coachee since 2016. So, and I've just seen how it's changed my life. And like, what do you say is like, what is like the big thing that people get out of coaching that they're not going to get on their own? Yeah. So it's a really important question. So it's the difference between self-coaching and, you know, where you you learn tools and try to apply them to yourself. You know, you read some self-help books, you listen to some podcasts or some, you know, some books on Audible versus talking it out with a real human being that, that can, can hear your situation. And, um, the, the way that I often describe this to people is it's like a coach in any other area of life, Mm -hmm. right? So when, 
when I had, you know, a, I play golf. I'm not, don't, don't confuse that for being good at it. I'm not good at it. I'm a, I'm a 15 handicap, but, uh, I, I love playing golf and, uh, out of the blue, I'd start snap hooking the ball. Right. And I had no idea why, like I can't see myself swing a golf club. Right. And right. so I could go watch all the YouTube videos I want and read all the books I want about how to swing a golf club. But it took someone else taking a video of me, showing me what was going wrong, and then giving me different thoughts to think while I was swinging the golf club. And all of a sudden, I'm hitting it down the fairway again. And and coaching, when it comes to life coaching or you know money coaching or any of those other topics, it works the same way. So when someone comes to a a coach, what you're doing is you're you're laying out your your scenario, right? And and the story that you've been telling yourself, which you believe is a fact. And usually it turns mm-hmm. out that 90% of it's your narrative or your perspective on the facts and 10% of it's facts, but you've already accepted that story. And so when you go to a coach who holds this non-judgmental space that you get to share, you're not going to be judged for the things that you're thinking or doing. And they're just going to point out, Hey, when you did that thing, it probably resulted from this feeling, which came from this thought. And do you really want to believe that thought? Is it serving you, right? Is it helping produce the things that you want in your life? And when you dive into that and someone points it out as that, you know, objective third party mirror, it, it is an immensely helpful. And another way that I explain this to people in case you're not a sports person is um, it, it's like anyone for anyone that's married or has children, right? The number of times you tell you know, your spouse, your partner or your kid something over and over and over and try to teach them something. And then someone else will come along with just a slightly different perspective and a different way of saying the same exact thing. And all of a sudden it will click and you're like, oh my gosh, I've been trying to tell you this for like two years. Right. And, and so for whatever reason, the way that human beings are wired, we're meant to find meaning in life. And sometimes, oftentimes I would argue it takes an outside perspective to be able to point out the things that we're missing. Um, and so coaching in a nutshell is what allows you to go through that process in a compassionate you know, way that doesn't have judgment or the shame that has to be associated with often our own self-critical, you know, inner critic. Amazing. Yeah. So I'm hearing like, I mean, I love that analogy of like holding a video up to the golf swing because you can't see your own golf swing, but then like in life, like you said, like those thoughts and beliefs that are running the show are very hard to identify alone. And like, like you're saying, like self-judgment pops up immediately. Like I shouldn't be thinking those things or I shouldn't right. be believing those things. But then a lot of people just get stuck in that spot of self-judgment, but not knowing what to do next. Yep. And like, I'd love to hear a specific, um, as specific as you can get around someone who's really made a shift through your coaching program. And quickly, I'll say like my own coaching experience was back in 2016, it was personal development, basically, where my wife, a friend of my wife's invited us over to learn more about a personal development program she'd done. And I was so against this. It was like a Sunday afternoon. And I'm like, I don't have time for this. Like, where are we going? What is this? I don't want to hear about this. And my wife's like, I'm not really sure what it is. But my friend said that after she took this personal development course, she yells at her kids less. And I was like, all right, like I wouldn't mind yelling at my kids less. And, and at that time, I was pretty confident that life was good for me. Like I had a decent house, decent car. But I was in like the worst shape of my life. I was very unhappy at work, waking up with anxiety in the middle of the night three times a week. Yeah. But I just thought there was nothing I could do about it. Right. I was like, this is just life. And then I went and it just like changed everything. When I saw what was going on behind the scenes in my brain and in yeah. my life and who like a lot of what I was doing was trying to impress people. I didn't even realize it. Um, like I couldn't spend time with my kids because I had a lot of self-doubt around who I was as a father and got a lot of that figured out. Sure. Um, so like what kinds of things? Yeah. Like what can you give like an example of like someone came to you and they said, you know, what was it that they were dealing with and that they could like unpack and go through? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the topics that come up really completely vary, right? So, um, I mean, sometimes it's about home life stuff. Sometimes it's about work stuff. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's about, I mean, I mean, really it touches on anything. Um, and so, you know, one example that comes to mind uh, that, that, I often share is, you know, I had a client one time who was a big, uh, busy, uh, working mother who was a physician. And, um, and so she had shifts that required her to come into the hospital. Um, and her kids would often, you know, be pulling at her and saying, Hey, I don't want you to go to work. Why do you have to leave? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so because of that situation, she had this inner dialogue that, she wasn't a good mom because she was having to leave her kids and go to work and, you know, where, by the way, she was helping other people in their lives, like, you know, saving lives and stuff. Um, so it's not like the work wasn't meaningful, but 
this inner dialogue about who she was as a mom because her kids were always saying, hey, why are you leaving? Uh, started to make her think like, hey, I'm a bad mom, right? And, um, and so that's the narrative that she had. And, and my job as a coach, and any good coach in my opinion, is going to be what I call a curious skeptic. So my, my job is to you know, basically be skeptical about anything that comes out of your mouth because you believe your story, right? And, and it's my job to point out that you know, the parts of it that are fact, the parts that are, are story, and if you want to keep choosing to, to, to have that same narrative, that same perspective, that same story, that inner dialogue, and, uh, and to be curious about it, to ask questions about it, and to kind of poke holes in, your, in, your, in your, your thinking, just to point out like, hey, you could be thinking something different. So you know, I started kind of digging around and uh, asked you know, eventually like, hey, um, have you ever had the experience that a lot of us have as parents where you're on vacation or you're off for the week or you're post call or whatever, and you have to run to the store to grab that one thing. And your kid's tugging at you saying like, Hey, I don't want you to leave. And you're like, I've, I've literally been around all week. Right. And so I pointed out to her, I said, Hey, um, has it crossed your mind that maybe the reason that your kid is pulling at you isn't because you're a bad mom. It's because you're a great mom and they want you around. Right. And, and are you being fair to yourself thinking the opposite story? Is that story serving you? Like, is there really a point at which your child is not going to want you to be around? Right. Like, could they ever have enough of you at the age that they're at right right now? (laughs) And, uh, and she realized, oh yeah, I guess when you say that it's not, so it's like, well, are are you just never going to work? You know, like what's the arbitrary amount of work that is going to be that you get to decide by the way. Um, that is too much or not enough to be around your kids. And she started realizing like, oh, yeah, maybe I am a good mom. My kids want to hang out with me. That means that, that they, they love me and they want to hang out with me, right? And, and so just kind of, you know, taking away at that story, at that, you know, that perspective that she had. Uh, and and, and you, the, the, the conversations vary from that to, uh, you know, journeys through imposter syndrome and talking to mm-hmm. surgeons about, their work and a bad outcome that a patient has and looking back with their, you know, 2020 retrospectoscope and, and, you know, judging their actions based on, you know, what, what has happened. And, and when you go through that story and you point out the things that are, are challenging or are hard about it, you, uh, you start to realize that, Oh, I'm not being very self-compassionate about what happened. Like I had a diabetic patient, they, they were old, they're a smoker, the wound didn't heal. I had this bad mm-hmm. outcome. And like, that doesn't mean you're a bad surgeon. And when you hear that back from someone else, like this is what, you know, like, Hey, can I just stop you for a second and say, Hey, here's a case presentation. There's a surgeon that had exactly the same situation and just bring out the facts and take away all the story about it. Like, what would you say about that surgeon? And they'd be like, that they were doing a really good job, that they did a good job taking care of them. I said, well, you know, why can't you offer yourself that same story? Right. And so when, when you break things down and bring it from an objective third party perspective and point out the, the, the thought errors that exist that we all have, right. Just cause I'm a coach doesn't mean I don't struggle from these same things. Cause I struggle yeah. with all of them. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's, that's, you know, a couple of the examples that I can think of off, off the top of my head. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And really like looking at that, um, you know, the story that they're telling versus like what's actually happening. And then what are they making it mean? Right. Like when the kids say like, you know, they're going to have like, I mean, I've definitely experienced that myself with my kids, like where it's like, yeah, they go through a stage of life where they can't get enough of you, no matter what you do. <laughs> like, right. Or like when I go for a run in the morning, this happened. I used to be trained for long distance running. They'd see me leave and they'd be like, oh no. But then I'd come home and they wouldn't even like, be like, oh, you're home. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey. like you weren't suffering this whole two hours that I was running. Like right. you were actually okay with it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And like, I feel like, so when you mentioned like imposter syndrome and, you know, am I a bad parent? Like, I feel like a lot of these things are, it's the human condition. I feel in that, um, people are wondering, like these, these things just go on in our heads. We have these thoughts, you know, they come to us, but is there, there's coaching. I feel like every world could benefit from coaching. Now, when it comes to physicians, like, are they going through like what you would consider to be a specific experience? Because I definitely get a sense, like my dad's a physician. I grew up watching mm-hmm. him. Yeah. And when you, he was, so he's a nephrologist, had a dialysis practice, uh, in Georgia, uh, for a long time. Mm-hmm. And he goes, but he, he looks back at things and he's like, yeah, I made mistakes. Like I, I, I didn't know enough information. I you know people died, you know? And it's like, and he's like, I try not to dwell on it too much, but I do think about it. And I'm like, wow, like those are some heavy things to carry of like this patient that didn't make it because of this mistake or something. And it's like, so do you feel like there's, you know, from a, from a, there's the human 
condition, but is there like the physician condition that kind of comes a little with the territory a little bit? So I think in the example that you just gave, that it's kind of a human phenomenon that happens in everybody. And I'm actually working on um, my new book right now. And the, and the chapter that I was, I've been working on for the last few days is about this phenomenon, right? So uh, something that we teach our clients is about choosing curiosity, curiosity over shame. Um, and so the phenomenon that you're, you're tapping into there is, is one of shame, which in coaching is what we call an indulgent emotion. Uh, and that can be defined as something that basically leads to nothing productive in your life. You, it, you know, things like worry and overwhelm and shame where they're just a cyclical vicious process where you think, man, I, I can't believe that patient died because I didn't do X, Y, or Z. You feel shame. You're embarrassed about it, which shame thrives in the quiet, dark places where no light is shined on it because we feel so ashamed about it that we're unwilling to talk to somebody, which is mm -hmm. ironically what helps fix that problem is, is shining light on it and realizing that everybody has shame and everyone struggles and everyone makes mistakes. And so, you know, as you have that shame, nothing productive comes out of it because you just come up with other, you know, examples, the more you ruminate on it of why you should be ashamed of that thing. And it just goes through the cycle the entire time, right? And so, you know, that compared to a, a regular not a regular, but a, a more positive, productive, negative emotion. Cause not all negative feelings are actually bad. And that's one of the things we work on in coaching is people are like, yeah, you know, I just, I just have the stress or I'm nervous before I do this thing. And, and I just, I hate the way that feels. And it's like some really great things that have happened in your life have come out of very stressful, nervous situations. So <laughs> maybe the goal isn't to get rid of those things. It's to learn how to actually, you know, work with them and through them and allow them uh, and to be productive, you know, because of them, not, in, you know, not, you know, not trying to get away from them. And so when you talk about the story that you're, you're mentioning with your dad, you know, that, that is shame and, and humans mm -hmm. universally all experience it. And, and one way to battle that is instead of, you know, taking that shame and overgeneralizing it, which is a type of thought error to say like, you know, I'm a bad doctor because I had this one thing happen when you forget the other 99% of great things that you've done that, that make you a great doctor. Um, you know, is, is to choose curiosity and say, Hey, what can I learn from this? You know, what could, what could have been done better? What, what were the situations that I was in that helped produce this perfect environment for that terrible thing to happen? Um, and how can I learn from this so that I can help other patients in the future? And when you do that, you're not judging yourself anymore. You're, you're it's a process improvement project, right? Um, and so that's called self-compassion. When you, you provide the same compassion to yourself that you provide to someone else who was going through the same experience and it wasn't you, right? So, mm -hmm. so self-compassion, talking about it, you know, that sort of thing, choosing curiosity instead of shame, like that, that sort of process is, I think a human experience. One experience I do think that is, uh, specifically physician oriented is, um, something called an arrival fallacy. And mm -hmm. so, right. The idea that, um, and, and this is where a lot of my work is done because, you know, doctors get to the end of the road. They're, you know, now a partner in their practice or they're an associate professor in academics or wherever they are. And, and they stop and they're like, Hey, um, like, is this it? Like, you know, I've done all these things and like, I'm not happy. You know, I have a dream job. I've, I'm married. I got kids, you know, or, or they do or don't depending on their, their, their life. But like they, they have from an outside perspective, what would otherwise be looked at as like the dream life and they're miserable, or at least they're not content. And a big setup for this is, you know, this process where, you know, you go through undergrad, right. And then and, and the Canadian system maybe maybe a bit different, but you know, in the American system, you know, you go through undergrad and you go through four years of medical school and then four years of residency and then, you know, potentially a fellowship. And like every step along the way, you're in like this four or five year epoch where things end and you're constantly telling yourself, okay, when this current journey ends, I'm going to be happy, but it keeps getting delayed down the road until finally, at some point you're just a practicing physician and there's no next goalpost. Yeah. And so you, you've had this thought the entire way that when you arrive, when you get there, you'll be happy. And you don't realize the entire time that you've been focusing on the wrong thing. It's not about the destination. It's not about the end product. It's about the process and enjoying the journey. And so really helping people to make that transition and realize like, oh, like this is a journey of becoming, which is going to be the human experience for the rest of your life. Mm. I think physicians are, are just so set up for that because of the way it's, it's such a tight, very well-defined framework to get to become a physician. And then at the end of it, you're left with this question of like, okay, but now what? Like, what am I supposed to do next? No one's telling me they don't know what to do with themselves and they don't have contentment. And, and so that's why a lot of people end up getting coached. Mm -hmm. 
Oh man, I love that. Yeah. Like seeing that it's kind of like always chasing that carrot, like, okay, when I'm done with undergrad, when I'm done with med school, when I'm done with residency, yeah. it reminds me of a meme I saw a little bit ago where it said something like, I didn't realize that adulthood was saying next week will get better over and over until I die. <laughs> because yep. It's like a similar thing. And um, yeah. And, and you're right. Like that, that system is so set up for like, okay, cool. Like, you know, I mean, obviously like, I mean, like the financial strain of residency and like taking on all that debt and it's like, okay, cool. Someday I'll pay off all this debt and then I'll also buy a house and I'll also have the car. And it's like, like all those like things. Yeah. That, that's, that's, like, that's a really, really good point. And actually, yeah. you know, that's what compounds the arrival fallacy, right? So they get to the contentment and the next stage is they're not content. And so they do what I did. They do what every, every doctor does. They try to find the contentment by making really bad decisions that at the time don't seem bad, but looking back, it's like, oh, well, I guess buying the, you know, the $750,000 house when I had $300,000 in student loans may not have been the best decision or, you know, buying the doctor car that needs to go in the doctor house. And there's actually a name for this. It's called the Diderot effect, right? So, you know, which is based on the famous French philosopher who, you know, there's an empress in Russia, bought her this, you know, bought all of his, his encyclopedias. He wrote books and, and things as a philosopher and she liked his work. And so he went from like a really struggling philosopher and author to being overnight wealthy, like a doctor, and then was given, you know, this robe, this velvet garnet, you know, nice robe. And when he put it on, he's like, oh, well, someone who has this amount of money from this Russian empress wearing this fine robe should have a, a nicer table and a nicer mantle and, you know, should have, you know, an, uh, you know, less humble abode. And, and like this guy, literally had a, a name, you know, named after him, like the Diderot yeah. effect, right? Because, and, and, and in the essay that he writes about this robe, which is kind of hilarious to, to read, um, he basically warns of the, the sudden accumulation of wealth mm. and how the, the purchases that follow in our attempt to find happiness and contentment and fulfillment actually make your situation worse. And so when doctors get to the end of this arrival fallacy and realize this is all life is going to be, they often will try to make purchases to make their life happier and they will, they will, what they, what that ends up resulting in, which is honestly really sad is they have all of these things causing burnout and moral injury in their life. And, and they've tried to escape it through these, you know, life happenings and purchases and the, the life they've created. And they trap themselves financially in a situation that they cannot leave now because they can't afford their lifestyle if they do. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's, you know, this, this, perfect storm of terribleness that that keeps doctors trapped in this burned out and morally injured kind of situation yeah no i get and i mean i, I had not heard of that before so that's that's a, the Diderot effect so that's pretty cool um yeah for sure like when i work with residents i mean i talk to them and it's like uh, you know this there is a light at the end of the tunnel financially uh in the sense that you know this debt isn't always going to be hanging over your head but part of like my and i mean i love in your book live like a resident you know that concept of like not necessarily letting the purchases you know, the, the cost of living rise with the income, uh, where I'm like, you know, just, just like you are someday going to be out of this. Like I had a resident who did, she did a specialty and she was in residency. It felt like forever. And I was like, someday you will be this. And she, when she flipped from making what she did as a resident to, as like an, a specialist, the word she used was surreal. Yep. She's like, Galen, this is surreal. Like the amount of money landing in her bank account every, every month. Like she was like, I never could have imagined this. And yep. I was like, and I just saw like, I mean, it's a great place to be in someone's life to help them not do exactly what you're saying of like going down this road of this is where I'm going to find contentment. Yep. And so I'd love to talk a bit more about that contentment um, because that arrival fallacy of like, well, when this happens, like whether it's money, like a lot of people, it's like, oh, once I have this ar usually arbitrary amount of money, then I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if they have, if they don't actually know what that's going to do for them, or like you said, once I have this house or this car, then like, I'm good to go. What, so that contentment, um, you know, how, how to find, how do you find that? Or how do you coach people around that finding that contentment? irrespective of what's going on with the house and the car and everything else. Yeah. So, so a lot of this is, um, you know, first about awareness, uh, you know, it's almost like having an addiction, um, that this arrival fallacy exists. Um, and then helping people shift their mindset away from setting those goalposts up that they know and have circumstantial evidence of, that have not produced the happiness that they're looking for. And so, so the, the question becomes like, if it's not about, you know, the end product, what is it about? And, and when I was coaching a, a client the other day, uh, he actually had this, this great quote, which was, you know, it's not, it's, you know, it's about the effort, not the outcome. 
right? And so it, it's it's about the process, and um, you know, and and so I actually, um, <laughs> I think the first time that someone ever pointed this out to me, and and I I love this story because it's uh you know, and again I'm writing a book, so everything I'm thinking about right now is coming from you know some some <laughs> the stories and the research and stuff that I'm doing for this. But you know, I, I had this guy that was actually you know way ahead of me in residency. I never actually was in training with him, but I met him at uh you know a, a state meeting. And, um, and he's actually famously known for, um, getting arrested after trying to stop a uh, paramedic from esophageally intubating a patient. So it turns out that when you put the breathing tube in the feeding tube, it doesn't really work. Um, and so, but he was in running shorts on a run. So they, they're like, who are you? Like, you know, get, get away. And so they, they arrested him for obstructing when, uh, he was trying oh to help, help them not kill a patient. And so, uh, Paul's well known for that, but he's also in my life well known for pointing out when I was in residency and I couldn't believe this at the time. He's like, you know, Jimmy, when I look back at, you know, my time in residency at Wake, which is where I still am, um, you know, I think about that, that small house in Ardmore, which is the neighborhood that surrounds the hospital and my, you know, my wife and my kids and how things were so busy and the house was so small, but those were some of the happiest moments of my life. And when you get to, you know, further down the road and have some perspective, you realize that the times in your life when you are happiest are when you are, you know, the psychological term for this is flow, right? So when you are in the flow, when you're in the process of something, it's actually not when you finish it and like, Hey, look what I've created. It's, it's when you're in the process of writing the book that you're happy. It's not when the book is published. It's in the process of painting the room, not when the room is done, right? It it is in the process Mm -hmm. of becoming a physician, not when you finish. And just like that with, with finances, it's the process of of accumulating wealth and enjoying the journey instead of looking forward to the destination that makes people content. And there's research upon research upon research that supports this idea. And so when you start to really believe that and you start to realize it's about the process, not the end product, um, you know, it it's it really fundamentally changes things. And and and, and like no one's to blame for this, by the way, because like sometimes people are like, yeah. well, you know, I can't help it that I'm wired this way. Like and so this has really fundamentally changed the way I even parent, right? So like, I, I don't focus when my kids come home with a report card on their grades. Like all of my kids are, are, are very smart. They're going to do well. Um, they are all their own worst critic, just like their father, <laughs> right? And, um, and so when they bring their report card home and they have all A's, I don't say, hey, good job for getting all A's. I'm not going to make it about the product. I say, hey, did, did you try your hardest? And they say, yes. And, you know, this report card, when my little girl came home with a, you know, a, a B averaging C, almost a C in math, and was upset that it wasn't, you know, an A, I asked her the same question. Hey, did you try your hardest? And she said, yes. You know, math's just, you know, really tough for me right now. And I said, I'm proud of you, right? Just like as if she'd gotten an A. And so, you know, in teaching them about that, because we're all so wired that way, because we came home and got praised for A's and, you know, and, and we certainly didn't get praised when we had C's, even if we were trying our hardest. Um, making that transition, you know, to to a process of flow and finding the breadcrumbs that life drops when we are in those moments, um, you know, and uh, you know, it, it, it's really that process of finding out what that is uh, and living in those moments as often as we can that we, we will find that contentment we're looking for. I got that. Yeah, no, I love that that idea of flow and like and definitely the pro like the process. Up here in Canada, we say process. Uh, when process. I moved up here, do you say alu- do you here, say aluminium too? Aluminium, I don't, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, aluminium. And then what was the other? Yeah, I had to I had to learn how to. I mean, I, I schedule. Yeah, anyways, when, you know, when I moved up here, I uh, process is one of the ones I did adopt uh, when I moved up here because people even now people are like once a month someone will be like, "Where are you from?" <laughs> and I'm like, I feel fairly accent neutral, but comes out. Um, so when it comes to those grades, I mean, I used to be a teacher and nothing drove me crazier than the kid who didn't work for the A that was praised like crazy and the kid who worked his butt off for the B that wasn't praised. Like it always drove me nuts because I'm like, this is like, and I hate grades in general. Like when I was a teacher, I really like, anyways, it's a whole thing I've got going on around the education system and grades and s- scores and everything. My wife's it's a the teacher same too. Thing. Like, yeah, what's that? My wife's a teacher too. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So, I mean, just the idea of like standardized testing and everything. I won't won't go down that road, but definitely seeing the process as the, uh, as the, like, enjoy that. Like, did you work the hardest? Cause for me, like exactly like that's the, that's the lesson is like, did you work hard? Cause if it came easy, 
you know, and I was always like these parents who were kids were getting straight A's and they weren't trying. It's like when they actually do have to try, what's going to happen? Or like when they do have to like go to that next level. Yeah. And, and that, that actually was, was my journey. Um, you know, I didn't really have to study until like my senior year in college. Um, yeah. and then when I got to uh, medical school, I almost failed out because I didn't know how to study. No, no one had actually made sure that I tried and turned out that, you know, getting, getting away with uh, medical school on just pure intellect isn't a thing. Um, yeah. like, like it's a fire hydrant amount of information, you know, as everyone always says, like I, I, I all of a sudden was sinking more than I was swimming, uh, you know, and, and the cream was rising to the top and because I didn't have that skill, it wasn't me, you know? And so, yep. um, I learned that the hard way. And, and I think many, many doctors do at some point in their career, whether it's then or, or, or later, uh, it, it, you know, it's about the process. Yeah. Yeah. Process. Yeah. No, Sorry. yeah. no, no, you can say it the way you say <laughs> I just, just noticed the difference. Um, yeah, no, I, well, I mean, I was at Johns Hopkins pre-med for one semester and I ditched it. I was like, I was doing like uh, non-organic chemistry mm-hmm. and I was just like, I, I wanted to help people. I wanted to become a doctor and save lives. And I was like learning about non-organic chemistry. I was like, I can't do this. And like, and then someone told me about residency. I did an internship at a hospital in New York uh, city, Bellevue. And, uh, and I also saw a lot of miserable doctors. So I also thought maybe this isn't for me. <laughs> so I, 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 the EMTs were happy. It felt like to me, like they had this really cool job and it was like a lot of variety, but then I met a lot of doctors that just weren't all that happy. And I was like, eh, I'm not sure if I want to do this. Yeah. Um, but I did want to ask about the process of, you know, let's say you are that career, that career physician, like, like you've made it, so to speak, you've got the house, you got the car, like, even, let's say, let's say like, okay, financially you have made good decisions, but you're still not content. Like, where do you find that flow in like the everyday? Because, you know, one could say that, like, what is that pro- process? Like once you're like, once you're established, like what's left as far as like, what do you look for in that case? Yeah. So, so this is actually a journey. And I, I think that, um, you know, it, it's an interesting thing because people often view these conversations as like a switch. Like, you know, I'm just going to flip this switch and all of a sudden I'm going to be content. And it's a lot less like a switch and much more like a dial um, where, you know, you gradually learn how to turn it up. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, you talked about the long, the long distance running that you do. Like this is much more a marathon than it is a sprint. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I saw this in my own life when, uh, you know, I, and starting in July, I went part time. And so I do anesthesia on Thursdays and Fridays and then, and then work on my business Monday through Wednesday. And, um, all of a sudden I had a lot of time that I've never had before. And I experienced a phenomenon at the age of 35 that most people experience when they're 65, uh, which is like, who am I when I'm not working all the time? Like that the process that people, I mean, there, there are hundreds, if not hundreds, dozens of books written on how basically not to suck at retirement. Right. <laughs> and, and the reason why is because so many of us, you know, don't realize, but we, we place our identity and, and, you know, community and things that are really important for human meaning and contentment in work. And so who are you apart from what you do as a profession? And if I'm being honest, most people I work with, including myself, don't know. And so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a journey to figure out what that contentment means for you. And, and what are you telling yourself if you're not saving lives at a hospital? Like, is it enough to drop your kids off at school and to pick them up and to, you know, do laundry and dishes during the day? Like I do now from time to time on Monday through Wednesday when I'm, I'm helping my family, like, is that, do I need the external validation that, that I've grown so accustomed to on this process of being praised for, for making excellent grades and, you know, all the accomplishments and accolades and awards that you get along the way? Like if, if none of those things are happening anymore and they all of a sudden go away, can you be content? And so it, it's a journey to find that process, you know? So like for the last you know, couple of days, I, I've been waking up and, uh, you know, drinking my cup of tea and having my time in meditation or reading scripture. And then, and then I, I write for a few hours. And, and now that I realize that I don't need that external accomplishment to know, to feel fulfilled or like I was productive because productivity for me, everyone's personality is different, but productivity for me is highly important for me to feel fulfilled. And so, Mm -hmm. but what I'm realizing is that I don't need it to come from the external world, right? Who am I apart from those things? And so I I think that that journey, um, you know, to answer your question in a roundabout way is, is kind of like, there's not a one fits, you know, one, one size fits Mm -hmm. all kind of answer uh, cause we all have different personalities, and different goals. But what I do know is that we all need connection. We all need community. 
Um, and we all need to know who we are outside of our profession, but with the way that medicine is and how t- directed that path is, n- none of us spend our time searching. And even my sister who, you know, she's a nurse now, but, uh, was previously in, in marketing at at and she pointed out to me, she's like, Jimmy, like, I feel like you're on this journey now because you didn't have the experience that most people have when they're trying to find themselves in their, in their, you know, late teens and twenties. Right. Cause doctors get that, that moment delayed until their thirties because like you just, the next thing in front of you, it's step one, then step two, then applying for, you know, residency and then going through it. And then, you know, becoming a physician and starting your practice. And at some point you have to look up and, and like you realize that medicine is who you are. Um, and, and just have to ask yourself, like, is this, is this healthy? Is this what I want? And for some, it turns out that they've been living someone else's dream. Yeah. Right. And so, so finding that journey looks different for everybody. Um, you know, but there, there are some common truths there. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, what I'm, what I'm hearing is there is that like exploration, that curiosity, that journey, like it's a part of figuring it all out and definitely like seeing with physicians that it can be that it's been a delayed searching or it's been like down someone else's path that was created for them. Yep. Um, whether that's uh, cultural or family, you know, sometimes that's the influence that has people kind of go down that route. Um, and actually, I was thinking of two things as you were talking. One is the movie about Schmidt. Have you ever seen that movie? With no, Jack I haven't. Nelson? Oh, it's Jack Nicholson. He retires and there's this amazing scene where he like gets the watch and the send off and everything. And he actually comes to work the next day. Cause he's like, Oh, I'm here in case you need me for anything, you know, like the transition. And they're just like staring at him and they're like, go home. <laughs> and the whole movie is about him discovering himself in retirement. Uh, because it, that whole identity of like this, who I am is what I do yeah. uh, from nine to five. Um, and so like that, anyways, it's not, awesome. I love that movie. It's one of my favorites. Let's check that one out. It's all about that. And especially as like, maybe if I, I don't know, as a financial planner, maybe it like speaks to me because so many people it's like, I mean, I've worked with physicians who've said, um, you know, uh, oh yeah, when I retire, I'm just going to sit around all day. And I'm like, you can't sit still right now. Nope. Like, what do you think is magically going to happen? Right. Like you've got like 20 letters after your name. You work at 10 different hospitals, <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, what's going to happen where you're suddenly going to be content sitting around doing nothing. And it was more of like, oh, I'm living someone else's dream here of like, this is how I'm going to show the world that I'm finally done is I'm going to sit and watch TV all day. And I remember in this specific conversation, the husband said this and I turned to the wife and I was like, do you really think he's going to sit around all day? And she's like, no, like he'd go nuts. Like he has to be moving. He like productive, I think is a big part of it. So yeah, I love that. Um, everyone's different. There's not one size fit all, but it's like being in that discovery of, what is the what is the the process we're in, and what is that journey, and like what does fulfillment look like? Yeah, and 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 there are some helpful exercises, you know, to figure out what what your ideal day, your ideal week, your ideal month or year look like, and mm-hmm. and I think those are helpful exercises with the massive caveat that the point of life isn't to try to find contentment a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, right. And so so a bigger you know a big part of that journey is what I mentioned earlier, being okay with like the 50, 50 nature of life that sometimes things are, are, are positive feeling and sometimes are negative feeling and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The goal is not to be positive all the time. Cause right. that would, and that's definitely something I got trapped in with coaching was like, I was very, you know, anytime that things weren't going well, like, um, like with my kids, I was like, Oh, like I want to spend more quality time with my kids. And so I'd plan out something and we go do it. And as soon as they started complaining, I'm like, that's it this isn't quality time anymore. Like I used to do that. Yep. I don't do that anymore. Cause I'm like, Oh, this is just part of being a dad. Like you've got kids that melt down and blow up and they're unreasonable yeah. or whatever. Like, it's just, this is, this is the, this is how it is. Turns out they're human and, too. And I don't, yeah, exactly. And I don't have to be miserable while they're doing it because I'm making it mean that this is not quality time or I'm a bad dad. Like it just totally changed everything for me. Sure. Um, and it's like, so one thing I wanted to ask was, um, what I hear, what I have heard, uh, like I feel like something. So there are some elements of well-being and coaching among physicians that there's almost like this, um, you know, there's this view of it that, well, we're all in this system uh, that may not be the healthiest system. Like the way that someone becomes a physician, residency, um, then the things that are happening, like it, it sometimes is not a setup that's conducive to well-being. Mm-hmm. Like expectations of working long hours and skipping meals and not having bathroom breaks. So what do you say to that when it's like, and I know we started the podcast talking a bit about those external factors, but what do you say to people who are like, yeah, all this sounds great, but I'm stuck in a system that is not conducive to well-being? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, So I I guarantee you there are actually probably people that have already stopped listening to this podcast because I haven't spent time talking about all of the uh, external things that are broken in medicine. Um, And uh, and so, and and the reason why is because, you know, 
these days, you know, having victim blaming is a big no, no. Um, and so, yeah, I have so many comments about it. this could be an entire podcast, but <laughs> I will, uh, I, I will try to shorten them up. Um, so basically the situation is this, the system is broken. It's fundamentally broken, right? We're all taught that the hospital is not going to love us back, right? We, we, we pour out our heart and our soul, our sweat, blood and tears, and the hospital just, just does what it does. And it burns doctors out. It morally injures them, which some prefer actually moral injury to burnout. And I'll tell you why I don't in a second. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it is a situation where the system is broken and, and that systemic and systematic solutions are necessary and required in order to fix the current trajectory we're on. Right. And I'm all about it. I'm all about empowering physicians to stand up, to, to vote with their feet, to have financial, financial freedom that allows them to live the life that they want and to really stand up for the change that they, they want to see. Um, so I'm all about that. The distinction is, is that people are making this, um, an all or nothing phenomenon. And so that's a thought fallacy, right? So, so it's not that you either fix the system or help the individual doctor. It's both. It's a both. And it's not an either, or, right? It's not an either or fallacy. And so, um, what my work does is in, and hopefully the bigger picture of it is to empower enough individual doctors that we can collectively come together and band together and to say, we're no longer going to put up with this lack of, you know, basically health and well-being for physicians. Um, like this isn't something we're going to tolerate. And, and I don't know what that looks like, you know, in terms of concrete terms in the future. But what I do know is that the individual work that's done through coaching can, can really change things. And that, you know, through my podcast, I'm now, you know, about to start working with a, a department and, you know, a big academic hospital um, where they want to buy coaching for all of their faculty, um, you know, and, wow. and I've, I've sat down at a dinner for this department, um, specific dark department in this hospital and, uh, and pitched ideas at them that are system, systematic changes. Right. So, um, like, <laughs> so, you know, in the financial world, um, and, and, uh, you know, the, the studies that exist with 401ks and 403bs and, you know, when they came up with those things, got rid of pension plans, there's entire generations of doctors, doctors, I always talk about doctors of humans, people, uh, that, uh, you know, didn't participate because they didn't understand what the plan was. And then they realized, oh, if we opt them in to this plan, they're more likely to see it work and therefore more likely to contribute in the future. So it turns out that putting them in an opt out situation where they're automatically opted in, you have to opt out, makes people participate in things and find out that they're helpful. So yeah. why don't we have an opt out scenario with coaching or therapy for physicians, right? Where we say, Hey, at noon on Tuesday, We've actually booked your clinic. We've actually, you know, blocked that that hour off in your clinic. Uh, we've provided lunch, or you can bring lunch for yourself. And we have a forty five minute coaching call set up for you. Um, we're doing this for all of our doctors. And uh, you know, if you find it helpful, fantastic. We'd encourage you to do it because we know that six to eight calls are enough to decrease burnout and improve emotional exhaustion and quality of life. And so we, we've arranged for this for you. Um, and and if you don't, if you're not interested. Uh, you know, you can absolutely opt out of it. It's not mandatory, but we want you to know that we're, we're taking the extra step to make this as easy and frictionless as possible for you to get the help that you need. Right. And so, so there are systematic solutions that can be put in place where people would then get coaching and therapy because a, it's not stigmatized anymore. Like you don't get help because you need it. Right. You get help because it's what is expected. And it turns out all humans need that third party objective perspective in their life. Um, you know, and in addition to that, they, they get help that we know helps. And so, you know, it, it, there are solutions and the system is broken and the electronic medical record system is terrible. It causes lots of strife and lots of pain. Insurance companies are trying to tell doctors how to, how to do their job. Administrators like to count metrics instead of, you know, counting quality of life in physicians. And so there are things that need to change, but just because we're working on that doesn't mean we shouldn't also individually empower physicians. And so, the second and equally important piece um, is that, you know, the reason people prefer moral injury is because they want to blame those outside things. The problem is, is that the second that you assume that kind of narrative, it's not that moral injury itself is a bad term because it is systematic, but the second that you assume that narrative, you, you've placed yourself in the position of being a powerless victim of a situation, mm. which is completely and entirely unhelpful, right? So, you know, can you imagine if Nelson Mandela had just you know, sat in jail and said, you know, oh man, like this is like terrible, this racism and systemic oppression that put me in this situation is terrible. And, and now I'm not going to do anything because I can't fix the system from where I am right now, mm. instead of keeping his head and refusing to be a victim, even though he was and, and changing things and continuing to work 
while he refused to be a victim and became the hero of his story or Reuben Hurricane Carter, who got thrown in jail for 20 years for a murder he didn't commit, right? And said, you know, you can take my body, but you can't take my mind, right? Or Rosa Parks sitting on a bus. I mean, there's example after example after example when we look at it in other people and say, you know what? Good people in terrible situations can refuse to be a victim and change this world, right? And that that is a good thing. But the second that it becomes to burn out and moral injury, we assume this victim role, yeah. which makes you completely powerless, which none of us want. So stop handing the keys yeah. to someone else to control how you feel, right? And start taking back the control while we fix this thing. And if they don't want to fix it, doctors are going to leave, you yeah. know? And, and that, that may be what's necessary for them to realize how bad it is. I, got I hope it. not. But Amazing. No, definitely. I get that. Like, yeah, it's not neither or and uh, doesn't have to be. And I think we've made perfect full circle back to not handing over the keys. <laughs> yeah. So starting and finishing with the same concept. Uh, this has been amazing. What I want to make sure that everyone knows is where to find out more about what you're up to with your coaching uh, and everything. So what's the best place for people to find you uh, online? Yeah. So the easiest place since this is a podcast is to go check out uh, the other two that I do, Money Meets Medicine podcast and the Physician Philosopher podcast. And if you're looking to get coaching yourself and you want to try this out, if you haven't before, uh, you can go to the physicianphilosopher.com slash coaching. And, uh, and yeah, you can actually book a call whenever you want. We just made that available starting today. Ironically, the day that we record this. Website, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> yep. Very cool. No, I mean, really, uh, um, yeah, like um, I love the insight you're having into the physician experience and the value of coaching. And really, I mean, I love to hear that you're actually, you know, collaborating with an institution that's going to provide it. Uh, proactively, uh, that just sounds phenomenal, like yeah. a phenomenal step in the right direction, yeah, for sure. Me too, and I hope more hope more departments and organizations come along. Absolutely. All right, man. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Gail. Thanks so much for having joined me on this episode of the Clean Bill of Wealth podcast. I truly appreciate you taking the time to do so. It really warms my heart to see the numbers of people listen to each episode go up. It's just a lot of fun. Feel free to scroll through the other episodes. I've interviewed a lot of really amazing people and just want to get their insights out there to Canadian physicians. If you're left wondering anything about your financial plan, whether you're making the most of your corporation, are you on track for retirement, are there more efficiencies you could be finding, feel free to head on over to galenhelpsdocs.com. That's G-A-L-E-N helpsdocs.com. You can read more about the work I do, uh, my offer of fee-based planning, which is pretty popular among medical professionals where you pay for a plan, you don't have to buy a product. Go over there, click a button, book a free call. We'll have a quick conversation and see if you're a good fit for the fee-based services. All right. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.